Please, Joe, tell us what trepanning is. Well, trepanning is uh, making a hole in the skull, nothing else, just that. Yes, and in the skull, in the, in the bone? In the bone, yeah. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, the reason is to increase the volume of blood in the brain. The volume of blood in the brain? Yeah. And what does that do? Well, it gives you more energy and a bit more consciousness. I was pleased that I decided to make a movie because it turned out a great help. The double function helping me to detach myself from the natural reluctance I felt to be subject to such a happening. Making the film was a sort of mantra. Now I just have to clean up and wait and see what happens. Trepanation derives from the Greek term um, trepanin, which is a borer, uh, and trephination is a French variant which refers to some form of drilling. They're pretty much used interchangeably and basically both denote making a perforation in the skull. Trepanation is an operation on the bone. There is no um, operative procedure there on the brain. This isn't a lobotomy. This is not anything that's going to damage brain tissue when it's properly performed. It's very ancient. It's the oldest operation in history. It's been done since the Stone Age all over the world. Right up until the First World War, it was done commonly everywhere. In the First World War, they started uh, brain surgery, lobotomy. And uh, then very clever brain surgeons have been prodding around in the brain ever since then. Of course, they have to trepan first. Trepanations were done in many parts of the world. Uh, the oldest trepanations date to the Neolithic. It's around 8,000 years ago. Those are in Europe. And the procedure became very widespread in Europe by 3,000 BC. It was done in virtually every part of Western Europe. Greece, Rome, into the Near East, Libya, Algeria and uh, as far south as Kenya. Medical texts from China as early as 3000 BC describe trepanation. Trepanation in prehistoric times was pretty much the only form of surgery practiced in terms of major surgery, except for amputation. Amputation is the only uh, other one that was practiced until fairly recent times when things like abdominal surgery and chest surgery were practiced. The majority of skulls are in Peru. And the collections in the United States all came from Peru. And fortunately, with trepanation, you've got, um, you either, the person either, it was either healed or they died. You know, there was not, uh, soon thereafter. So you can actually see, for example, in this one, uh, almost the day these cuts were produced, this person died. They're so fresh and so without any kind of degeneration or ossification at all, calcification of any kind. In some cases, you can see the the marks of the operation very well, like here, you can see very clearly where they were cutting through. Uh, and in the drilled skull, you can see very clearly also the individual drill marks. So it was something, it may have been a bird bone and sand, we don't know what they were using in fact. Some kind of bone or a metal tool and an abrasive. This would have taken a long time if you can imagine. Some of the trepanations are very large, three, four inches in diameter, so exposing a very large part of the skull and yet they healed. And they healed to an amazing degree. You know, some individuals were trepanned as many as seven times, each one done at a different time, each one showing healing. Our other evidence shows that uh, the trepaners tended to avoid areas of the skull that are covered with muscle and, and, uh, and uh, tendons and, and would be difficult to, get, to cut through. Once you get down to the temporal areas, you have the temporalis muscle with a lot of blood supply and nerves, and it would be a very difficult place to operate. So this area up here is the easiest for access, certainly. The earliest uh, trephanations had a survival rate of about 40%, uh, so more than half of the patients died shortly after the operation. By the time you get to the Inca Empire in the 14th and 16th century AD, you have uh, survival rates of 75%, which is much better than Western medicine did until 
antiseptic techniques were popularized in the, in the latter part of the last century. And a lot of our common ideas about how primitive cultures and prehistoric cultures functioned tend to be, uh, we tend to infantilize them. We tend to make them think that they were far more primitive than they were. And I don't necessarily think they were, they were, they were um, extremely advanced or anything, but they, they practiced common sense and crafts, and uh, medicinal crafts were part of what they did. And uh, we, we, I learned to give them credit for developing such a practical way of dealing with this. In the fourth century BC, Hippocrates described the surgery in great detail. And then Celsus, the Roman physician writing around the time of Christ, uh, described the procedure, and it was Celsus' procedure that was done throughout the Middle Ages, even until this century, uh, the technique of Celsus was used. So this is a very ancient procedure. There are some scattered reports up until the last century of people doing trephination in isolated towns in Peru and Bolivia. And unfortunately, no one has been able to actually confirm those. But there are some eyewitness accounts from the 1890s of traditional healers doing trephinations and people who had survived them. So somewhere, who knows, hiding out there in the Andes, there may still be someone who knows how to do one. Dawn in the uplands, the land of the Kisi, the land of mystery, and a chance to see the operation of the skulls, the medicine man. In old Africa, he is the man who knows everything. There is a crisis here, and the witch doctor must act. And so he prepares, testing the sharpness of the blades. All night long, the preparations continue. The preparations of the body, of the mind, and of the soul. The time is at hand. The preparations are nearing completion. Green, hairy leaves are used as swabs. These leaves are poisonous if taken internally but considered to have great healing power. The operation is about to begin. No anesthesia here, no hypnosis, only the psychosomatic belief and faith in one man, the witch doctor. Opening of the cranial cavity is the most delicate of operations. After three and a half hours, the patient is tired she is given something to drink, some water. Skull surgery, trepanation in the outback. No oxygen, no surgical lights, no scrub nurses, no anesthesiologists, no neurosurgeons, not even sanitary sterile conditions. And yet, the chances of survival, 96%. The patient's head is washed clean with the old scrub water. Warthog fat is used as a dressing. What condition is the operation directed against? Anything from cancer of the brain to simple headache. Strips of banana leaves are used to bind the wound shut. No stitches here. And after seven and one half hours, with a large hole in her skull. There for the rest of her life, the patient walks away. And it is a time for the doctor. Time for him to show the results of his skill. Other trephinations, others with permanent holes in their skulls. Holes covered so thinly by scalp that each person must wear a head garment to protect his brain from the sun. One person has had 13 such operations. The Kisi of Kenya, in many ways they're they're very similar to what the Inca were doing. They're using very simple implements oftentimes. In this case, they often use things like pieces of uh, metal from tin cans or pocket knives, things that are metal and are common objects today that you know are different from what the Inca would have in their hands. Simple things that cut. I don't know where the concept in Europe came from of releasing demons. That, that clearly is something in, in the Middle Ages that people have talked about as a a reason for trephination. Exactly how that evolved, I don't know, but uh, that's something that 
has erroneously sometimes been extended worldwide um, to say that that's why everybody trefined to release demons from the head. I think, I think it was, it may have been true in Europe at a certain time period, but it's not a, a human universal, I don't think. It is more likely to me that these were being done for some therapeutic reason that the patient kept coming back for them and um, that they were done for reasons that we don't understand. Basically, every priest caste did some form of skull binding or trepanning, like the, even the Christians, who never expect to do anything. Um, the monks' tonsure is a relic of when they used to trepan. And the reason for the priests and the ruling caste trepanning was one, because they felt better, but two, it's because in, in those societies, the priests and the um, kings used to take the magic, whatever it was, mushrooms, um, I, they took the substances of the gods and it was found out that um, the people who had been trepanned um, were less inclined to flip out, freak out when they came off the gods' mixture. So that's why it became a kind of um, inbuilt thing that the priest caste was trepanned. There must be a very good reason why the Stone Age people, from there on up to modern times, have been trepanning all over the world, not just in Europe, everywhere. And why the contemporary primitives are still doing it. This is a painting of Bruegel, another old Dutch painter. And this person is most interesting. He has been trepanned. And you can see an owl on his chair. The owl means his wisdom has come back. This one shows another trepanation clinic. They're putting a bandage around his head. He is finished, and this is the rondel from his head. And this patient is tied to the chair. So you can see here two trepanation, one after the other. This is a picture of Hieronymus Bosch. If I translate the letters into English, they say, Master cut the stone quickly. My name is Flipped Out Cat. So it means, I'm flipped out. Please cut the stone to cure my insanity. Because he was done to cure insanity throughout the world, um, and migraine, those negative things of humanity, that got it a bad name. It became associated with insanity. So people would say, I need that like I need a hole in the head, meaning it's the worst of all the possible things you can have. And that's because all the people who had holes in their head had been insane. Bart Hugus was the first person who knowingly made a hole in his skull to restore the intracranial pulse pressure. When I met him, I mean, the first thing that struck me about him was, well, he's the sanest man I've ever met. Very impressed with Bart. He's a genius, and uh, he's actually the only genius I know. Very interesting to listen to on almost any scientific, biological subject. I've studied medicine in order to become a scientific discoverer, and that's what I am. And I wanted, in the first place, to discover how to cure psychosis. And I found it can be cured by skull trepanation. Then I found more. I found skull trepanation gets you high. There were two people who, sitting with me, the three of us, in a van, uh, told me a thing. One said he had had a car accident that had left him with a hole in his forehead, and I could feel the hole. <clears throat> and the other said, I have always had a hole here in the fontanel. In other children, it seals around two years, and in me, he said, it never sealed, it has always stayed open. And he said, so I don't have to smoke marijuana, for I'm already high anyway. And the other one said, all right, it's correct what he says, but I also have the hole here. And I still smoke marijuana because it gets me still a little higher than just a hole. How many people that you know of have, uh, have traveled? <clears throat> well, I know, I'm just guessing about 20 people. Now, press the perforator against the skull. 
Manually rotate the Hudson snap lock on the driver until the perforator is in the engaged position. Hold the assembled perforator and driver perpendicular to the skull. Now apply power, maintaining constant but controlled pressure while drilling. I decided that uh, I did want the permanent method of increasing my brain blood volume, known as trepanation, and uh, I began studying the operative procedure and gathering together the instruments that I would need to uh, be able to do this on myself, and I started off by um, trimming the hair back. I had hair at that time, actually. <laughs> I had some hair. I, sh I should say I had a full head of hair. A very small patch was shaving my head, uh, head that much. And just here, for vanity's sake, so I could cover it with a hair grip afterwards. A very important thing was that we'd bandaged all the hair around, because it's very important. Sterilization is the most important thing. I uh, made a T-shaped incision right here on my forehead, uh, horizontal, and then a vertical just a little cross cut, which just opens up by itself because of the tension of the fluid in the area. So you're left with a neat little hole. And I had a shield over my brow here um, so that there wasn't any blood dripping in my eyes to obscure my vision. Okay, so I, I pulled the flaps of skin back and inserted a fairly sharp pointed bit to get a pilot hole started in the skull bone. I was trepanned in March 1995 uh, in a hospital in Cairo. I might have considered uh, trepanning myself, but um, Amanda was quite keen to try and get it done medically. Now I used the uh, method of a uh, electric powered um, flexible shaft drill uh, to do my operation, which I had hung um, up above my head in a comfortable position so that I could reach up and hold that drill bit handle comfortably and also look into a mirror. And I'd practiced this uh, drill bit placement and whatever on um, a uh, piece of bone previously. In my case, I started with the hand pan and progressed, which is a lot easier with electric, especially doing it to yourself. It's like trying to uncork a bottle from inside it. I went ahead using the sequence of drill bits, a pilot drill, uh, a larger, faster cutting drill through the first layer of bone into the spongy inner bone. It feels as though you come through the skull much sooner than you have because the middle of the bone is actually very soft and that's a real shock because you don't expect it to come so soon. And then as I got through to the bottom of that, I shifted to a much smaller blunter drill. This is the drill bit which fitted perfectly through the little hole. The drilling is probably the shortest part of the actual operation. He drilled a rather small hole and then he broke around the edges. And actually you know the second you're through because then there's no resistance. But I knew the drill was harmless <clears throat> and I wanted to know how it feels if you push the drill inside uh, this fire. Well, you don't feel it. Inside is no more feeling. So you can push it in and the smooth point of it doesn't do any damage. Yeah. Where, where in your head did you drill the hole? Just here. Yeah. That was just because I was looking in the mirror, so I had to, it was the easiest place to do it. It's not necessarily the best place, but the median line is the best place because that's where the, there's less blood because it's where the arteries of you know, the final smallest twigs have gone up each side. What is the uh, sufficient size? Well, um, <clears throat> six millimetres is sufficient. You know, I don't know what the smallest size would be, <clears throat> whether a bigger hole makes you higher or, you know, honestly, all of those things are very interesting. Maybe two holes better than one, I, I don't think so. It's the restoration of something you had once before. And that is, when you were a child, you had a fontanelle that responded to the heartbeat. And that response to the heartbeat produced a very active, vital uh, individual. And as you became an adult, that pulsation was lost. So what you're getting is your childhood level back. Sometimes I feel my energy is really 
<laughs> buoy, and I don't, but I think that happened even before the accident. I had a tendency to be hyper at times. Uh, but when I run now, I've had some of my best running you know, really recently, like that I've had in years, like since I've been 18, I'd say, or 20. And uh, it's, a, it's a real energy rush and just falling into stride and just feeling really good running in the dirt. I don't get stressed out as much as I did before. I'm definitely more relaxed, but I don't know what to attribute that to. Because uh, my, my injury was a life-threatening one, and the surgeon let me know that I probably should be dead. So I don't know if it has to do with that, the fact that I feel just really, really fortunate to be alive, to be here. Once one understands that all that is happening is that you're giving your brain more blood so that it can function clearer, like any other organ when it's needed to function more, more blood is directed to it. Um, it puts it all on a completely different workaday level. Today, we know that a hole this size, which is less than three-eighths of an inch, is adequate to restore pulsation. So I um, went ahead drilling, and as um, I was using the blunt drill, the drilling got rather slow, and um, the very bottom of the drill there broke through the bone, and I could feel it start to give way, at which point I knew that I had penetrated through the bone and it was time to stop the drilling. It was a very, very quick operation. I couldn't quite believe it was over. I do remember actually a terrific feeling of sort of delicious sort of cold shower. I did it in the middle of the night and uh, that was a success. It was finished in half an hour. Only it took me four hours to get the blood off the walls I hadn't counted on the electric drill making a fountain of blood that went on the ceiling. I hadn't counted on that. That was the one thing I hadn't counted on, but that happened. I withdrew the drill. The newly restored pulsation blasted that blood that accumulated up there into a spout coming out of my forehead. And for a moment, I freaked. I thought, oh, no, I've, I've cut into an artery. And um, it was a, a very strange moment. Uh, I had completed the operation. I was elated from that. But then I had a horror uh, reaction there for a moment. And then I heard gurgling in my skull as the new equilibrium of brain blood volume and brain water adjusted itself. It was very quick, a, a terrifying ordeal. But it was quick. Um, and I did it in painless. It was numbed first and then he went through just here. Um, immediately he got through. He thought he'd got through just before actually getting the point. And something, although I wished and longed for him to have got through, I, wasn't, I was unsure. And Joe came and checked and no, he wasn't through. So my God, the drill had to start up again. And, um, and then a few seconds later, I knew he'd got through. And it was like a, the wings of a butterfly or something. Or somebody had switched a tiny switch inside me and suddenly it felt as though things were moving again, like they should be. You know, just like this, moving again. And then I thought, well, as I'm an artist and as um, one doesn't seem to be able to get any um, serious media cover, I'll make a film of it. Although I show this film of my own trepanation, I am not in favour of self-trepanation. I think it should be done by the medical profession. I show the film now in the hope that it may attract the attention of some doctor, able and willing to start their sensual research into the subject, without which it will not become an accepted practice available on the national health to anyone who wants it. And maybe as art is a complete non-entity in the modern world and it's just a um, financial game not a function which carries great psychic truths that used to in the old days um, I'll make a film and, and maybe with that I can help wear down the taboo against the knowledge I don't want to recommend anybody to do it themselves I mean I really don't think that's a sensible thing 
anybody who's listening to what I'm saying, don't go off and get a drill and think you can do it yourself um, without really studying it very, very carefully and asking someone who knows or whatever. I mean, it's not a sensible thing to do. Um, what you should do is go and find a doctor to do it for you. I studied medicine at Amsterdam University, which is here. I did the final exam and I was refused. They have a tactic to uh, say no to you, even if your marks are high. And I didn't uh, feel like repeating it because the next time they would refuse me again. They refused me because I had been in the publicity about marijuana and about the third eye. I had learned of Freud that people need something to become sharp. Freud sniffed cocaine and he was punished by nose cancer. That's what you get if you sniff cocaine. So I realized that I was not going to sniff cocaine, but that something was the matter with using drugs. And <clears throat> that finally made me decide in 62 to investigate marijuana smoking. Most people at that, at that time, in that period, were using drugs to increase their brain blood volume, to expand their consciousness, and they were doing it in a kind of willy-nilly way with uh, very variable results. Some people were having good experiences and some people were having bad. Bart used to have a scale. He said, well, if an adult is zero and an acid is 100, and say smoking hash is 50 or 60, depending on the quality, then trepanation's perhaps 30. It's like an 11-year-old. I, I think that's the sort of level of um, energy and enthusiasm and... I had um, taken a lot of psychovitamins. I found that one couldn't really use them as a working tool for life. Well, they were more a trip to the fun fair. Now, the mechanism of brain blood volume had come to my mind after marijuana smoking, standing on the head by an American who told me it got him high. And then I decided I had to go to prison to have scientific circumstances every day the same. When man stood upright, he obviously got immense advantages of sight and movement of the hands and uh, everything when the monkey or ape stood upright. But then the disadvantage was that gravity pulled the blood out of the brain. So I stood on my head. And then they rushed into the cell, the officials of the prison, and they said, no, 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 that is not allowed here. So I wasn't allowed to stand on my head anymore and gave up the investigations. <clears throat> but I knew already that it did get you slowly a little high. I think there's a kind of urge to get high, to expand the consciousness. And people without knowing it, um, chase it one way or another. Either they have a habitual a habit of losing their temper or driving dangerously or going to football matches or sport or sauna. I worked out a way of first sucking the blood as much as I could from the abdomen to the lungs, in the lungs, and then while keeping the abdomen constricted inspiring with air fully and then pressing up the blood through the veins. There are no uh, valves in the veins between the lungs and the brain. I knew that from anatomy. And you have to know that for otherwise it's no use if there are valves, but there aren't. So you can, <clears throat> from the lungs, push the blood up into the brain. And I did this time after time, but on this Hatha Yoga method that I had designed, it didn't work out until the third day, then halfway the day, suddenly I felt as if corks from bottles were squeezed out. I felt pop, 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 pop at six different places all at the same time. And after that, I felt a hot feeling at the skin of the back. And this feeling is described in yoga books, old yoga books, as Kundalini, the hot snake at the back. At the same moment, I started laughing and 
I was top high. For it is that quickly once the blockages are gone, the brain blood volume is immediately increased completely. I was sitting, uh, singing and giggling about how funny the fate of mankind was <coughs> to be so unhappy and be able to be so happy by just taking his blood in his brain. <coughs> and I thought, well, this message is uh, the one and only important message there is. And five hours after the Kundalini, the beginning of it all, I was as down as that morning when I wake, woke up. I was uh, a uh, graduate of University College Oxford, which is where Bill Clinton went to study as a Rhodes Scholar. I was given the task of teaching him international relations after 1919. John Lennon was visiting Amsterdam with Yoko Ono, and they were receiving all kinds of people. And John Lennon kept uh, telling me that he wanted to have the third eye too. And I said, well, I'm certain you have it. Uh, third eye people are your kind of people who do such difficult things as you getting a whole uh, singing group together that becomes world famous, writing songs that everybody is singing now and wants to hear. I said, there's no doubt about it that you have the whole. He said, no, 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 I don't believe it. He kept wanting it and I kept contradicting him and telling, don't drill it for it will be a deception. You will know there's no difference. And Yoko Ono understood me well. In 1550, Machiavelli writes down that every change in society that an individual pushes forward meets with a gigantic uh, rejection by society which threatens his life and makes it very difficult to bring about because of the authorities in society that have not brought about those changes themselves. There's no evidence that under normal circumstances the brain function is limited by blood flow. So that uh, increasing blood flow isn't going to make things better. There is a, uh, a very tight control of blood flow through the brain. Uh, it's directly related to the metabolism of the brain, <clears throat> of the energy the brain needs, and is very tightly regulated. If the flow uh, goes below a certain level, you suffer. If it goes above a certain level, you suffer. Blood flow to the brain is kept pretty constant, uh, um, no matter what the status is of the skull. Does removing that piece of the skull result in increase in brain blood volume? Temporarily, it might. Yeah, it might. But it would reach a new steady state where it would restore. In other words, unless the the. Uh, Unless the uh, 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 space under the sc scalp start, just kept swelling, so sooner or later the pressure there is going to come back to normal because uh, uh, you can't keep increasing the volume of spinal fluid under the, under the skin. You, know, that you have a big bulge. There are mechanisms that help control blood pressure and so on in the brain, uniquely to the brain, that other organs don't have. Uh, the brain is, is uh, quite sophisticated in that way so that when you uh, when, you're, when, you're, when you're ill or you're injured, your, your body's basically designed to preserve your brain's function and will sacrifice other parts of the body in order to maintain the, the oxygen and glucose supply to the brain. It'll go from a certain level to about 10% more of consumption. But the blood flow is, is, is only regional changes. You see? So there's no 
it cannot go very high. If you increase the blood volume more than the, the normal flow, you will start stressing the, the, uh, the function of the system. The point of the hull is not to make the brain surface larger or anything like that. The point of the hole is so that the membranes which surround the brain can expand on the heartbeat because in order to have pulsation it has to be against an elastic and expandable surface. The brain membrane can expand on the heartbeat and thereby give pulse pressure to the contents if there is anything moving outward. The easiest way to get a picture of um, expanded consciousness through increased brain blood volume is through um, understanding about the vasoconstricting um, properties of all drugs which get you high. If the veins are constricted, you have the same amount of blood going up through the arteries into these very flimsy little capillaries, which are very expandable. Less is coming out through the veins, so the capillaries expand. Um, and there are a lot of capillaries, a lot of veins in the brain, a lot of cells, and that's happening all over. So the brain gets flooded with blood. In the baby, I mean this one here, you can feel here the fontanelle, where the, the plates, you know, there are two fontanelles, one here and one here. When you finish growing at the end of growth, yes. all the sutures have sealed together, right. and the skull becomes a completely rigid case of bone around the brain. So the brain, as an organ, can't pulsate on the heartbeat. Now, the reason for making a hole is to allow it to pulsate again. Unless, of course, um, he had a metopic skull. There are a percentage of skulls known as metopic where the sutures don't seal. 10% in Amsterdam of people, the frontal suture does not seal. And they have found on many graveyards all over the world that if an archive was present, then the open frontal sutures belonged to workmasters, doctors, uh, notaries, uh, generals, uh, captains of industry, but always to the top class and never to the bottom class, the lowest workers. We know very precisely what happens, uh, uh, what to, to holes that you make in the head, because probably I think in terms of Trepanation, there's more trepanation now in the last 50 years than has ever been done before. <laughs> because first of all, there are many more people. Secondly, the techniques have evolved now so that people have neurosurgery. There was no neurosurgery 100 years ago. So now there are so many people, we know exactly what happens to them. We know the effects of these. And one thing we know for sure is that they don't, we don't suddenly have saints and, and savants uh, developing from this procedure. Theoretically, if one is able to constantly change the perfusion to the brain, then you might have some changes in neuronal activity, some enhancement. I, I guess theoretically it's possible, but the whole problem in the theory that, that has been proposed by the trephinators uh, has been, is that uh, any, any changes would not, uh, if, if one had a transient change, I, I don't see how it would be translated into a a chronic or um, long-standing change? Well, I'll, I'll go out of limb. I mean, the, the possible mechanism might be something like um, just, the, just the trauma of producing the hole will irritate uh, the brain in that, you know, to some extent. Uh, it'll cause probably some regional uh, swelling and irritation or something like that. It might have some sort of reciprocating effect on the dynamics they think exist. It, but it's, it's not that easy to produce significant changes in CSF flow or blood flow, especially when you don't ever, ever do anything to the blood or the CSF. <laughs> if you don't actually somehow intervene in the system that's um, supposed to change or whatever, you, you really, I don't know how anyone could even, even speculate there would be one. It'd be interesting to uh, do research on that. And I'm sure there'll be lots of volunteers. I've got lots of volunteers. You know, who would be bound to be subjects in research program. Someone would just do it. I want it done. They might as well study on me. I'm a fairly normal person. And you recently did a trephination operation? Sure, yeah. We operated uh, on a seven-year-old boy who had a rock thrown in his head and uh, had a depressed skull fracture. So in that instance, what we did was we created a, a hole in the skull, drilled out the bone, we repaired the bone, and then 
replace the, uh, the bone uh, in its normal state. This is a modern day drill bit that we use for um, creating burr holes or trephinations. The drill itself actually has a little mechanism within it where once the skull is perforated through both its tables, it stops automatically so that the brain and the covering of the brain isn't injured. Here's a skull where a hole has been made through both the inner and outer tables. And then once it's gone through, it just turns but no longer cuts. There's a great need for uh, a genius from Caltech or MIT to take up the subject of electroplasmiography, which is measurement of blood pulsation, intracranial pulse pressure inside the skull through some electrical means without opening the skull. Okay, so that the average person walking down the street can go into the hospital, get a test done, and determine whether his pulse pressure is positive, in which case he wouldn't need a hole in his skull, or negative. If it's a research project on human subjects, it has to pass a board of a review for it. Uh, 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 IRB, they call it Intramural Research Board. Uh, I doubt that any board would approve this. Uh, and if they were to do it on their own without a review board, they would, let, I think, open themselves up for uh, malpractice. Because no one's actually done a controlled study of this, so everything I'm saying is couched within that. Um, I can't imagine the controls are ever being done. I mean, it's it's uh, it's hard enough to get more innocuous things, you know, uh, approved for that kind of human research. We've been trying to develop a better way of looking at brain movements in the living person. And I, I was a guinea pig myself. For three hours, I was in an MRI scanner while they made a movie of my brain pulsations. And I have no holes in my skull other than the normal ones for my eyes and my spinal cord coming out, the normal holes. And there is a pulsation because, first of all, the, there's all these fluids surrounding the brain and there's this big hole at the bottom. And what you see is the brain is pulsating and is moving in and out of that hole. So there's a pulsation, distinct, measurable. You can see the whole brain pulsating like a, not as much as the heart pulsates, but uh, it's pulsating. We've done research where we make openings in animal skulls to um, study, experimentally study head injury. Uh, we not noticed any sort of changes in perfusion that are associated with the trephin, you know, the opening alone. But on the same token, we didn't really think about the opening in the skull as being significant, so it hasn't been studied in the same way as an actual traumatic head, uh, brain injury is studied. The medical science hasn't addressed themselves to explain how, what is happening when consciousness is undoubtedly expanded. What is more conscious than conscious? It's sort of a joke that goes on with uh, some of my Italian friends who constantly tell me about buying extra virgin olive oil. What's more ex virgin than virgin? You know, I don't understand. <laughs> is there a consciousness at a level above, you know, what is considered normal? Certainly. I think a, a creative musician, a creative physicist, is thinking at a very abstract level. That itself is a very high level of abstraction. Then there is spiritual consciousness. Uh, and this is a very interesting field because, and this is, we have no objective documentation of it, but you have a lot of anecdotal and historical uh, experiences that have been written by, for example, the philosopher Buber. Martin Buber, uh, in his writings, described very clearly that there are two fundamental types of mind, basically. There is the, the, av the average person, and then there's the ecstatic person, the person who can feel this ecstasy, which again is a very strong and powerful emotion, and this is the basis of spiritual experience. This is mysticism. I think it's an undoubted fact that one can change the level of consciousness that one experiences. If the whole brain with full brain metabolism, brain blood volume, is working, then in yoga literature it is called being God. The collective unconscious has come to consciousness. That's what it is. And I call that the rest of the brain has become high uh, conscious. Attempts have been made to try and get some physiological correlations with 
these kind of uh, mystical powers or bodily powers, I call them, also, because uh, the classical set of studies have been carried out by an Indian uh, physiologist who studied here, at the, uh, worked at the National Institutes of Health. He uh, went back to India and was able to get um, uh, yogis who were expert in uh, suspended animation. They could uh, live in a small uh, uh, grave, basically, that was dug for them, and they would uh, survive for up to a week uh, with no food, no water, and no more air other than what was uh, uh, given to them. You know, you can alter your bodily functions and reduce the metabolic rate uh, quite remarkably, slowing the pulse, dropping the blood pressure, uh, dropping a temperature, increasing the temperature. And this has been done and has been documented also with a lot of biofeedback work. But in terms of a chemical correlation with consciousness at a higher level, uh, there have been no studies done that, are, that have shown anything. People have attempted, but one of the problems is that this is an area which is at the boundaries of science. Scientists usually tackle problems, what are called well-defined problems. There are very few people who will go off at a tangent and try and discover something totally new. Every, everybody starts off in science uh, learning something, learning a technique, and very often you, they do a very good work following that technique. But to go off at a tangent and do something new takes a lot of courage, and uh, if you don't have funding, you don't do the science. That's always the problem. First you must know all that is known. And then you must find what is not known. And then you must decide what is important to sort out yourself. Well, take Pavlov. He, long ago, had one aim to cure insanity. He found a cure, and the cure was giving the dogs food with hash in it and amphetamine. Are there any uh, scientific evidence that this is an actual, uh, um, has medical... I think as doctors, the first um, promise that we make is to do no harm to people. And so I think we have to be terribly careful about anything which isn't really proven. I only would ask doctors that they add something to their practice called trepanation on demand. Continue practicing medicine. You guys are doing a great job. We're a healthier world than we've ever been before. But please, let this opportunity be available. I consider it the function of the profession, the medical profession, the brain surgeons, to do the operation. But before he can start doing that, it must be scientifically verified by the profession. They should be studied carefully to see um, whether this is true or not. Because, you know, if you believe something and you do it, you follow that belief, you will always as long as your belief is maintained, you will feel the benefit of that belief. If you believe that uh, putting um, uh, straws of a certain color through your earlobes, that you will relieve all pain, it will relieve all pain for you. I'm open to the possibility that these changes could be due to some phy physiological change, my change in attitude, my greater acceptance. Um, however, I don't know because I, I don't have a test case absolutely crucial to have some kind of a control mechanism for these subjective judgments because that, those are your dependent measures. So if somebody says, okay, my memory's better, my memory's worse, we test them. Th those things are, are subject to their own behavior and attention and belief that what they took was an effective substance. I asked to have the hole filled in um, and the surgeon thought it was probably it made for a sounder skull, so if I was in an accident or car accident or um, biking accident, something like that, that uh, I'd be less likely to have any brain damage occur. Recently, I have not felt probably as euphoric or as full of energy. I feel more fortunate on a steadier level, although I do have creative spurts, especially in my writing. I'd say recently, though, I have been uh, probably a little more stressed. Uh, for a while, I remember I was, and I was pretty carefree. I don't know if that had to do with the fact that maybe um, being alive has that, the joy of that has worn off a little bit, or the freshness of like, wow, I just survived something really badly has worn off a little bit. Um, and I'm more back into the humdrum of everyday life. 
what is the evidence that there is an improved performance other than this, what they say they feel? Right, but the fact <laughs> that they, I mean, calmness, and whether that's delusional or not, or is, still doesn't deny that they have this and they also have, you know... But that could be delusional. They may feel calm because they did something to themselves and they, that they thought should make them feel calm, so they feel calm. The placebo effect is known, it's about 30 percent, you know, it's, all, it's a big, that's why all drugs have to be tested beyond the placebo effect. If it's a placebo effect, I recommend it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to address the point of the placebo, I think the fact that when we thought Jerry had got through, and the fact that one didn't notice any difference, and then he had got through, one did notice a difference. I think that that shows um, that it's not placebo effect. If I had gone to the trouble to have a trephin, to have a hole in my head, it, I, you know, it would be very, very difficult for me to think that it wasn't helpful, to think that the, all that was foolish and that I shouldn't have done that, or I was placing myself at risk for, you know, for an infection and, and death. I think that the, there, there's, a real, uh, there's a real problem. A real, the, I think there may be serious you know, underlying psych, psychological problems in these individuals. Uh, and they definitely should be evaluated. They all have a common background of drug taking. And, uh, and so, for, uh, you know, with that kind of background, there is a certain um, mindset of what you expect to happen when you do something like this, you see. And that, that, that mindset will be similar because of the similar background. They are, they are not, they are not a, a random sampling of people doing a trephine uh, hole on themselves. They are a certain special group and a small group who have a common history, uh, who have certain you know, problems that they're trying to solve in their lives, and then carry out this very traumatic thing. So it's not surprising to have a common experience. The profession has not started even studying the subject because they reject it from the beginning. They say, that is nonsense. I do not have to spend time neither to study this nor to verify this. I think he's delusional. And there's a lot of suggestion that can be passed from one person to another about odd things like that. But let's do some research. Yes. Let's do some research. Yeah. Rather than just sensationalize it yes. in the newspaper. Well, how viable a thing is that? Is, is, is life that boring the way it is in, in normal consciousness? That you need to take those risks to, to live it more fully? And this vicious circle has not been broken for 30 years and it can go on for 30 centuries. For you cannot force them to do anything. You cannot make them interested in it. If someone would be interested in the subject, his colleagues will drop him as uh, insane or wrong, at least. Well, it is interesting to see someone who actually has been to Japan and just because yeah. I always thought it was just like there was going to be this yeah, hole and like blood dripping off. Yeah, blood, you know, and it'd be oh, sore yeah. and everything. Yeah. So good on you for coming on, Joe. Thank you, yes, strawberry jam. Yeah. Uh, do not do this at home. Yeah. We're talking something uh, quite, quite adventurous. I've been uh, detected uh, a fraud many times already. That's what people do to uh, anybody who tells something that people do not know. Time to stop the drilling.